thank you again for taking time to join the Secretary of State Secretary of State's office. Uh, my name is Jessica Ventura, and I am here on behalf of Secretary uh, Levon Griffin Villade, and I'm also joined by other Secretary of State staff. Kathy Way uh, will be on mute and off camera, but she is helping us uh, take some notes for us to share with uh, the well. different explanatory yeah. statement committees okay. as also, well as. Um, I printed and if you're joining us, please put yourself on mute. Your temporary insurance card, and along with. I will mute you all as we go through this process. So um, again, uh, my name is Jessica and I'll be facilitating today's public hearing. I'll start off with a little bit of just organization and how the afternoon is going to go. Uh, first, before we begin, I want to state for the record the Oregon Revised Statutes that govern today's hearing. Uh, pursuant to ORS 250.217, no later than the 95th day before the election, the Secretary of State shall hold a hearing in Salem or virtually upon reasonable statewide notice to receive suggested changes to the estimates or statements or to receive other information. At the hearing, any person may submit suggested changes or other information orally or in written or in writing. Written suggestions or other information also may be submitted at any time before the hearing. The Financial Estimate Committee shall consider suggestions and any other information submitted under subsection 2 of this section and may file revised estimates or statements with the Secretary of State no later than the 90th day before the election. Also, pursuant to 251.215, Section 2, no later than the 95th day before the election, the Secretary of State shall hold a hearing in Salem upon reasonable statewide notice to receive suggested changes or other information relating to any explanatory statement. At the hearing, any person may submit suggested changes or other information orally or in writing. Written suggestions or other information also may be submitted at any time before the hearing. The committee for each measure, measure shall consider suggestions and any other information submitted under subsection 2 of this section and may file a revised statement with the Secretary of State no later than the 90th day before the election. There are two initiative petitions and three legislative referrals that we are going to be taking public comments on today. Uh, there is initiative petition 17. This increases the highest corporate minimum taxes and distributes revenue to eligible individuals. State replaces reduced federal benefits. Initiative petition 35. This is relating to cannabis retailers and processors must uh, remain neutral regarding communications to their employees from labor organizations and some penalties are included in the measure. The three legislative referrals will start with referral 401. This amends the Constitution related to the impeachment of statewide elected officials by the Oregon uh, legislature. Referral 402 also amends the Constitution related to establishing an, an independent public service compensation commission to determine salaries for, for specified officials. And then referral 403, this is a statutory amendment uh, which is related to the establishing of ranked choice voting here in Oregon. After today's hearing, the Fiscal Estimate Committee and Explanatory Committees for each measure will review public comment and they are scheduled for potential reconsideration. The Fiscal Estimate Committee is scheduled to meet again Wednesday, August 7th at 1 p.m. if comment is re received on the measures. In accordance with statute, the Financial Estimate Committee shall consider suggestions and any other information submitted under subsection 2 of the section and may file revised estimates or statements with the Secretary of State no later than the 90th day before the election. The explanatory committees are also scheduled to meet uh, for possible rec reconsideration at the following times. Measure, uh, excuse me, Initiative Petition 17, uh, their reconsideration meeting is on Tuesday, August 6th from 1 to 3 p.m. virtually. And Initiative Petition 35, their reconsideration meeting is on August 6th, that earlier in the day from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. All of these dates and time can also be found on our Secretary of State's website. In accordance with statute, uh, the committee for each measure shall consider suggestions and any other information submitted under subsection 2 of this section and may file revised statements with the Secretary of State no later than the 90th day before the election. The original statement and any revised statement must be approved by at least three members of the committee 
If a member does not concur, the statement shall show only the member that dissents. I do have a few more reminders and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, you may also email written comments prior to the start of the hearing uh, and even afterwards to elections.sos at sos.oregon.gov. Please indicate in the email subject if your comment is about the fiscal estimate or the explanatory statement. Written testimony can be submitted electronically until August 2nd, 5 p.m. There are a few ground rules that I want to go over. Uh, so I will be facilitating today's public hearing. The meeting is scheduled to go from 1 p.m. to 3.30. Uh, we do have some flexibility at the end, just depending on how uh, the other measures go and the public comment that we receive. But in the interest of making sure that we can take testimony on each measure, we'll pro proceed by allotting 30 minutes for each measure in the following order. We'll start with referral 401, then move to 402. 403, then we'll move into the initiative petition, starting with initiative petition 35, and then we'll uh, end with initiative petition 17. Uh, I do ask if there are a lot of people for any one measure that we limit uh, testimony to three minutes, and this is just to give everybody an opportunity to provide public comment. Again, you can submit written comments to, to us via email as well. Um, I'll make sure to give you some sort of visual warning um, uh, just to let you know that you have about 30 seconds remaining. I will hold the public hearing uh, meeting open until 4 p.m. Uh, everyone will, will be given the opportunity to testify once. Uh, this is just to ensure the floor is open for everyone. Again, please submit any additional comments in writing if you would like to supplement your verbal testimony. A few more things about Teams, for those of you ha who haven't really used Teams before, um, so we are recording today's public hearing. We're going to post it afterwards on our Secretary of State's website. Uh, please put yourself on mute until you are called to speak. And if you are here uh, to provide testimony in Teams, please raise your hand. At the top of Teams, there's a little hand. You can click on that um, and have that on until I call your name Your name uh, to provide public comments and then just make sure that you turn it off once you are called. Uh, this will help me just kind of keep track of who is testifying um, and who is not. If you're using Teams anywhere on your mobile app, uh, I believe there are three dots at the bottom of the of the app, and you can also look for the raise hand feature in that app as well. Uh, when I call your name, uh, please state your name for the record and begin your public comments. Uh, the chat has been disabled in this meeting. I just want to let you all know about that. Uh, and we expect all comments to be germane to the topic in civil. Please remember to state if your comment is on the fiscal estimate or the explanatory statement. Uh, please also put your name on Teams profile. And again, when you raise your hand, that's when I'll start calling people for each of the measures. Please do not speak unless you are called on. Um, again, we're scheduled to have this meeting up until 3.30, but I'll stick around until 4 just to make sure that we uh, get everybody who wanted to provide public comments the opportunity to give us those uh, comments. Um, after the initial 30 minutes on each measure, we will continue in that order uh, of referral 401, 402, 403, IP35, and IP17 uh, throughout the next few hours. Um, and then for our purposes, just so that we can uh, make uh, take good notes and give those to each of the committees when uh, you are called to testify, please state for the record your name, the city, and what measure you're testifying on. Please also indicate if you're testifying on the explanatory statement or fiscal. And then <laughs> I know I'm being repetitive, but just want to make sure that you're getting all the information that you need. Again, if you if you want to provide written comments, you can do so until August 2nd, 5 p.m. Um, and we'll give you that email address one more time. I uh, really appreciative uh, for all of you who are here uh, to give us uh, public comments. And I am now going to open the first 30 minute public hearing on referral 401. So if you are here for referral 401, if you can raise your hand um, and I will call you. If you're not here for 401, uh, I would say you can turn off your camera, go on mute, do whatever work that you're doing. And then um, in about 30 minutes, we will move on to the referral 402.
And just as a reminder, referral 401, this is an amendment to the Constitution, and it's related to the impeachment of statewide elected officials by the Oregon legislature. I will go ahead and put myself on mute. It is a busy uh, day at the office, so <laughs> just if I see folks walk in uh, or come into the team's invite and raise their hands, I will call on those folks. Okay, Sarah, I see you raised your hand. Um, if you can go ahead and put yourself uh, off of mute. Quick question. Um, yep. How much time will we be given for our testimony? Um, depending on how many people are, if there's a lot of people for a specific measure, then I probably will limit those to three minutes. But if it's only two or three people for a 30 minute block, then, you know, I think we're a little bit more flexible. And is there a place people can submit written testimony as well? Yep, uh, you can submit written testimony to elections.sos at sos.oregon.gov. Elections.sos at sos.oregon.gov. That's correct. Thank you. Yep. And again, right now we have started our first 30 minute block on referral 401.
For those of us who are just joining, uh, we started the public hearing and we are currently on the public hearing for referral 401, uh, which is related to the impeachment of statewide elected officials. In about 25 minutes, we'll open up the referral, uh, the public hearing for referral 402. If you're here for referral 401 and want to provide public comment, please use the raise hand feature at the top of the team's invite. Okay, so in about two minutes, I will go ahead and move on to referral 402, which is a little bit sooner. Um, I don't see anybody on here right now for referral 401. Um, after we go through all the referrals and the initial petitions, I will just circle back and triple check that no one else is here to testify on referral 401. Okay, I'm going to temporarily close the public hearing on referral 401 and we'll open up the public hearing for referral 402. This amends the constitution. It's related to the establishing of an independent public service compensation commission to determine salaries per, for specified officials. If you are here to provide public comments on, on referral 402, please raise your hand. Okay. 
and I will stay here for about 10 minutes before I move on to the next referral. Hello. Hi, this is Brett. This is he. Hey. Can we keep this one open for another seven minutes? If you're here and want to provide public comments on referral 402, please raise your hand. For those of you just joining us, uh, thank you for joining the public hearing on for the fiscal impact related to explanatory statements and legislative referrals. Right now, we have a public hearing open for legislative referral 402 that amends the Constitution, and it's related to establishing an independent public service compensation commission to determine salaries for specified officials. If you're here to provide public comment on legislative referral 402, please uh, use the raise your hand function at the top of the team's um, application.
OK, in about four minutes, I will be closing the public hearing on legislative referral 402 and opening up the public hearing for legislative referral 403. Hi, um, so for We are still currently on the public hearing for legislative referral 401. If you are here to testify on legislative referral, referral 401, please raise your hand. I'll go ahead and uh, temporarily close the public hearing on legislative referral 402 and we'll come back to it later just to make sure that nobody is here to provide public comments on that. And I will go ahead and open up the legislative referral for 403. This is the statutory amendment related to the establishing of ranked choice voting. If you are here to provide public comments on leg legislative referral 403, please raise your hand. And I see um, a couple of folks. So I'm going to go ahead and start with um, SAS. Uh, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Please state your first name, uh, last name, and um, start your comments. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you giving me the opportunity to uh, give testimony. My name is SAS. I'm in Eugene, Oregon. Um, the Oregon Supreme Court ruled in Sazanowski versus Legislative Assembly that the certified ballot title for legislative referral 403 does not comply with Oregon law. However, due to other laws, the court is not allowed to enforce the correction of the ballot title. The explanatory statement mirrors the language in the ballot title, including the specific sections that the Supreme Court ruled uh, do not comply with, with Oregon revised statute. Um, the ruling states that the candidate receiving majority of votes wins, but that phrase does not accurately describe the measure. Instead, the court ruled that the phrase majority of votes must be changed to say majority of votes counted for active candidates in a final round of tallying. The entire phrase is what, is what it has to be changed to. The ballot title was modified to include, <coughs> excuse me, the ballot title was modified to include in final round or in final round of voting in some parts, but the phrase for active candidates was excluded everywhere. Uh, and again, the, the way that because of a recent law passed, the court is not, a, even though the court ruled that, that, that the ballot title must be modified to reflect, to reflect the, this fuller phrase, uh, it, is, it has not been in the modified ballot title and the court is not allowed to um, enforce that modification, unfortunately. 
Um, it is important. I want everybody to fully understand and as well as the explanatory state uh, committee to fully understand how ranked choice voting really works um, and, and for voters to understand it before voting on whether to adopt it. So the following is an accurate description of of um, the of ranked choice voting that includes all of the important details. So voters rank candidates uh, as they like in order of preference. So first, second, third. Equal ranks are not allowed. Candidates left blank are ranked last. To tally it, votes are tallied in rounds. Your vote goes to the highest ranked remaining candidate on your ballot, if any. Otherwise, your vote is discarded. If a candidate has a majority of remaining votes in a round, they are elected. Otherwise, the remaining candidate with the fewest remaining votes is eliminated. Really important to understand, as the Supreme Court ruled, that it's only remaining votes for remaining candidates or hey, the votes you have for one minute left. Thank you. Um, another important thing to know about this uh, about this this measure is that it gives the uh, Secretary of State the ability to take power away from county clerks to do their own local tallies for ranked choice voting. And we know, based on implementations in Maine and Alaska, that this will be necessary to actually implement ranked choice voting. So and, and it, that, that's an important change that uh, must be made to our election tally process. So currently, ballots are tallied and retained locally, allowing anyone anywhere to finish the tally for state elections and check the work of the Secretary of State before results are certified. But under a ranked choice voting, however, ballots from every county would need to be physically centralized to a single point of failure in Salem, and no third parties would be able to check the work of the Secretary of State until after the results are certified. Uh, this necessarily delays the publication of results and reduces election integrity. And this is backed up by public statement that has previously been given by the um, Oregon Association of County Clerks uh, when they were testifying on this measure, which was um, never worked on, the, the legislature never worked with the association when they were drafting this measure. Um, Great. So that's well, probably my thank time. You thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. If you do have additional comments, please make sure that you submit written uh, written comments to our email address and I'll post that again afterwards. All right, uh, next online here, I have Kelly N. If you can just unmute yourself and then please state your name, full name and where you're calling us from. Oh, Kelly, can you hear? I cannot hear you. I can come back to you while you're getting your audio stuff all set up. Um, I will uh, go ahead and move to Dean Sir. Hi, Jessica. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to share here. Uh, I'm reading the modified ballot title as the Supreme Court apparently has adjusted it, and I find it confusing and um, uh, misleading, and I think the general public would interpret that as well. Under today's elections, the highest vote getter wins. It's black, white. You either voted for that person or you didn't, and and the highest vote getter wins. Uh, with ranked choice voting, it's possible that the um, in the first round, whoever got the highest number of votes, that person would not win. Your it could be the number two or number three person um, in terms of the first round vote count, and that's not described here. The title, the first part of the title, actually says gives voters the option, gives voters option to rank candidates in order of pre preference. Um, it's not an option. You, you, there, there is no other choice. You have to either vote traditionally or you vote under ranked choice voting. They, the two systems are entirely different. And I think that is misleading and confusing for the public and should uh, definitely be uh, reviewed and considered. The summary statement, the 500 word summary statement uh, does not deal with uh, this issue either. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dean. If you can just lower your hand and go on mute, I, I would appreciate that. Um, Kelly, I'm going to come back to you. Is your audio working? I still cannot hear you. I'm so sorry. I, I can um, see okay. that she's unmuting, but uh, yeah. I can't hear her either. Yeah, I can't. Okay, good. We'll, we'll come. I'll keep trying each time. <laughs> we'll make sure that you are able to provide compliments uh, one way or another. Um, I'm going to move on over to Sarah Wolk. Sarah, if you can just unmute yourself and start your public comment. 
and please state your name and, and where your calling is from. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Wolk, and I'm testifying today that the explanatory statement and ballot title for LR 403 are misleading, omit critical information voters need, and that they're setting Oregon up for massive backlash and buyer's remorse when voters realize that the claims made by advocates, the legislature, and even the attorney general are false or misleading. RCV has now been banned in 10 states, and it's been repealed by 19 jurisdictions that had adopted it. False and misleading claims are a central reason cited for these repeals and bans. I used to be an advocate for RCB, but changed my position and now oppose the reform after learning that many of the common claims made in voter education and advocacy materials were incorrect. Worse, this is not an accident by advocates. It's a tactical decision that telling voters what they want to hear is worth it when the claims are persuasive and that the more groups repeat these claims, the more likely they are to pass as true. I know that calling a statement written by legislative counsel false is a strong statement and I don't make it lightly. I've been working in this field for over 10 years now and I'm a peer reviewed author on this subject, but you don't have to take it from me. The Oregon Supreme Court has also weighed in to rule that the ballot title as written is misleading and that the way the word majority is used is false. And it's clear that the explanatory statement is closely based on the first draft of the ballot title. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court no longer has the power to enforce its rulings on legislative referrals due to recent procedural changes. Without that mechanism for checks and balances regarding the ballot title, it becomes even more critical that the explanatory statement be revised to make all the disclosures voters deserve so that they can cast an informed vote this November. The RCV measures explanatory statement says, the candidate receiving the fewest votes in each round is defeated, and the defeated candidate's votes are assigned to the voter's next highest ranked candidate. This process continues until a candidate receives a majority of votes. The claim that a minute left. majority of votes is false. Some voters will have been eliminated, exhausted, spoiled in the tabulation process, and RCV only ensures that a winner has a majority of remaining votes. Studies have shown that over 60% of RCV elections that have more than one round of tabulation do not result in a true majority winner. 60% do not result in a true majority winner. Some voters whose other down ballot preferences could have made a difference if they had been counted are ignored under ranked choice voting. And ultimately, the RCV winner may actually be opposed by a majority of voters who had preferred another candidate over the RCV winner, as we saw in Alaska recently. The explanatory statement makes no mention of the fact that the measure would revoke the authority to tabulate elections from the counties and would require centralized tabulation under the Secretary of State, which undermines trust in elections, undermines chain of custody, and makes errors more likely to happen and harder to catch, as we've seen recently in California and New York City. The Oregon Supreme Court All right, Sarah, has ruled that- you, your, your time is up. Um, I can come back to you if there's no additional folks uh, just to finish, but I do want to give time to, to other folks as well. So um, let's see how the- <laughs> oh, then, <laughs> no worries. Um, all right, Kelly, let's let's go back to you and see if we can make this happen. <laughs> you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Um, I don't think she is with us. Okay. Her name is Kellen. Oh, Kellen, sorry. Okay. Um, I have... Arend next um, to testify to provide public testimony. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, I'm commenting on explanatory statement 403, and I want to quickly apologize for speaking out of turn earlier. I, I misunderstood the process. Oh, no worries. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm Arend Castelline, and I'm the production lead at Equal Vote. We're an organization that focuses on educational efforts for better voting methods. I take issue with how RCV is defined in this statement. In particular, the sentence, this process continues until a candidate receives a majority of votes. That statement is very misleading. I recommend it be revised to state majority of remaining votes. In each round of tabulation, there are ballots which can't be allocated to any candidate and become exhausted. 
And RCB's claims majority only pertains to those non-exhaustive ballots. If you include the exhaustive ballots, then um, RC might not have a majority at all. In each round, um, oh, sorry. So I'm gonna elaborate on some of the ways those ballots can be exhausted. Some votes simply become exhausted because the voter chose not to rank enough candidates. And that's that's a good reason for it to be exhausted. But there's lots of other bad reasons for it to be yeah. exhausted. So um, ranked choice voting ballots uh, often had a limited yeah. number of, of ranks. Okay. Um, historically, that was three ranks, but more recently, it has been increased to six to 10 ranks. Um, and um, in all those cases, if there are too many candidates, the voter could feasibly use up all of those, those ranks and be exhausted just because they're mm -hmm. of that limitation. Um, ballots can so also be exhausted due to voter it. error. If a voter gives their first choice rank to multiple candidates, then they will immediately be exhausted and the further ranks will not be counted. Then, yeah, Skipping ranks can also lead to exhaustion. I'm unsure which approach Oregon is will be okay. taking, but in New York and Alaska, ballots with more than two consecutive skipped ranks will immediately be exhausted. In San Francisco, on the other hand, those skipped ranks are not considered an error, but this creates an issue with interpreting voter intention. If a voter only specifies their first rank and their last rank, then it's entirely unclear if this voter would want their vote to even transfer to their last choice. And um, this is one of many trade-offs that you have to take into account and with dealing with unclear um, voter intention. So, Sorry, you have a minute left. Awesome. Um, so adding more ranks can reduce ballot exhaustion due to the rank limit, but it also results in higher rates of ballot errors. And in my view, this trade-off is unacceptable, and it's why Equal Vote recommends pushing for star voting or approval voting instead, since those methods do not have and to revisit, the original description implies an absolute majority, but this is impossible for any voting method to guarantee. In reality, um, if you have, or as an example, if you have three polarized candidates, each getting one third of the vote, then there will not be a majority, regardless of the voting method. The misconception mm -hmm. that RCB guarantees a majority creates a oh, harmful a... false standard that risks setting up voters for disappointment and also risks hurting the voting reform movement as a whole. False promises create a very real risk that RCB's failures will um, not only hurt RCB, but take down the rest of the voting movement down with it. That's my time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ari. And then just to clarify, were those comments related to the fiscal statement or the explanatory was, statement? Um, explanatory statement 403. Okay. Thank you so much for clarification. Um, we are still on the public hearing for legislative referral 403. This is a statutory amendment related to establishing ranked choice voting. Uh, is there anyone else that would like that hasn't already provided uh, public comments that, that, that are new that want to provide public comments on uh, legislative referral 403? I see you, Sarah. I just want to make sure nobody else. Okay, Sarah, we can go back to you um, and I'll give you an additional three minutes and then I think um, we'll have to stop and wait to see if other folks have any comments. Now you can put yourself on. Uh, and then just uh, clarify too, I didn't, and sorry, I didn't clarify this for you earlier, whether or not you're talking about the explanatory statement or the fiscal impact statement. Yeah, speaking for explanatory statement 403, and I do have a comment. Um, Kellen has emailed me her testimony, but she said she okay. could come back on before 4 p.m. if that's not too late or, or if somebody else could read it, um, I could read it for her. But okay. Um, fine as well. Okay. Yeah. As long as we have those written comments, we're good. Uh, we'll share those with the committees. Thank you. Yep. So, picking up where I left off, um, 
One more point is that the explanatory statement makes no mention of the fact that the measure would revoke the authority to tabulate elections from the counties and would require centralized tabulation under the Secretary of State, which undermines trust in elections, undermines chain of custody, and makes errors more likely to happen and harder to catch, as was seen in New York City and Alameda County, California, both of which um, mistallied their ranked choice elections and reported incorrect results publicly. The Oregon Supreme Court has ruled that the RCV ballot title is false and misleading in its use of the word majority and that it needs to be revised to make it clear that this is a majority of remaining active votes in the final round, not counting exhausted ballots. That is a lot of jargon for everyday voters to understand. So the takeaway here is that ranked choice voting rounds of tabulation eliminate candidates and also eliminate voters. So the final round of tabulation will have less candidates than originally and also less voters. It's very important to note and to explain that not all exhausted ballots were just left blank for the down ballot rankings. Voters who did rank all of the candidates or whose ignored rankings could have been relevant can also have their ballots exhausted. So my recommendation is that the explanatory statement be amended to clearly disclose that ranked choice voting has high rates of ballots that are voided by voter errors, high rates of exhausted ballots, which are ballots that cannot be counted in the deciding round, and that winners will have a majority of remaining non-exhausted non-exhausted votes only. A better wording would be that the winner will have the most votes after the elimination of some candidates and some voters for the, from the tally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before I go back to Aaron, anyone else that's new that wants to provide public comments on legislative referral uh, 403 related to the establishing of ranked choice voting? Um, Aaron, we can go back to you. I, I apologize if I'm not saying that correctly. Uh, no, you're saying it uh, perfectly, actually. Okay. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so uh, I want to build a little bit on that. So I've, we've been talking about how RCV is complicated, um, not only because of the exhausted ballot situation I talked about earlier, but also because of the precinct summability. And um, Sass and Sarah already mentioned it. Um, and, and I wanted to kind of build on a little more. So uh, they created this, created this problem in Portland where they had to change their process from independently um, uh, tallying the precincts to having it be more centralized, which reduces transparency, but it also creates more risk of errors. And there have now been two elections where the jurisdiction has incorrectly tabulated their results and proceeded to um, certify their election without catching those errors. And um, if the method were precinct summable, then it would be more likely that they could check their work as they go and notice that. Uh, those two errors where one of them had happened in 2021 in New York City, where they certified the election without noticing that there were 135,000 test ballots included in the tally. Another uh, example was in 2022 in Alameda County, they misconfigured their tabulation software and all of the elections were tabulated incorrectly. In both cases, again, the jurisdiction was unable to catch the error on their own and they weren't, they didn't discover it until they were notified by a third party. Human errors happen, but the failure to catch errors speaks to a fundamental issue with RCV. If you go with RCV, then you're sacrificing um, that precinct summability um, property. And that's not even that much of um, a high a high bar because um, most methods are precinct symbol. RC is actually a rare exception. Um, so uh, yeah, so if you go with a method that can be um, tabulated decentrally like our current method or a method like approval or choose one or, or um, star voting, then um, each of the precincts can be tabulated independently and uh, those can 
those individual results can be combined to get the final result. And this makes tabulation more transparent and it makes it more likely that errors are caught. And this should not be something that we should sacrifice when we're upgrading our voting um, uh, method. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to provide public comments on legislative referral 403? I'm going to keep this open for another nine minutes and then I will continue on with the two initiative petitions. OK, I want to do one last final call before we move on to uh, one of the initiative petitions. Um, uh, Sass, I see your hand up. Yeah, I actually have a, a short little thing I forgot to add clarification on my testimony, so I'll just take this opportunity. Um, so the the process uh, typically for ballot measures before the procedure was there's a ballot title is written um, and uh, by uh, I believe the Secretary of State or, or, or someone else, and then there's an opportunity for public comment. And then there, it gets modified, and then it gets submitted, and the Supreme Court takes a look at it and decides whether whether it, it's good to go and it complies with Oregon Revised Statute. Then it's called SB 28. SB 28 was passed, I think, in the previous uh, legislative cycle that for legislative referrals specifically, the process changes. And the process changed for explanatory statements, too. But so for the ballot title, now that is written by uh, uh, a committee in the legislature, and then there's a very narrow window for um, electors in Oregon to petition the Oregon Supreme Court uh, to review it to ensure that it complies with Oregon Revised Statute. Uh, and um, and then one person did that, uh, and then the Supreme Court ruled that it did not comply with Oregon Revised Statute. Uh, and then they uh, were able to refer that ballot title to the attorney general for modification in those ways that I talked about. The attorney general did modify it, but they did not modify it in the ways the Supreme Court said that they were supposed to. Uh, but the Supreme Court now is not allowed to enforce those modifications that the attorney general made. So there isn't a modified ballot title and has automatically been certified, but the Supreme Court is not allowed to uh, to to enforce the changes that that they themselves ruled needed to be there because of the the change in procedures. The explanatory statement committee has had a similar change where it is no longer accessible to our the accessibility to the public is, has been reduced. The public has less input. As to, and I thank the Secretary of State for 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 holding this um, this opportunity, uh, uh, giving the public an opportunity to to comment and give pass those comments on to the explanatory statement committee. So thank you. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, okay, we are going to be moving on. Um, if if Sarah, um, we've taken a couple public comments from you already. So if you have additional comments, please submit those in writing. Um, and if we have time at the end, um, I'll come back to legislative referral four hundred three for additional comments. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move on to initiative petition thirty five. Um, this is a public hearing on initiative petition 35 related to cannabis retailers, processors uh, must remain neutral regarding communications to their employers from labor organizations under some penalties described. If you're here to provide public comment on initiative petition 35, please raise your hand. Sir, are you also here to provide comments on initiative petition 35? Sarah, I see your hand up. Are you also wanting to provide public comments on initiative petition 35? Sorry, I just had a quick question about the deadline to submit written comments. Okay. 
What is your question? When is the deadline to submit written? Uh, August 2nd, uh, 5 p.m. OK, thank you. Yep, no worries. And that's the same email address that you gave me before? That is correct, yes. Uh, and I'm going to state it one more time uh, for anybody who missed that from me. Um, the email address to submit written comments are going to be elections.sos at sos.oregon.gov. Again, that's elections.sos at sos.oregon.gov. Deadline, August 2nd, 5 p.m. That's correct. Okay, we are on initiative petition 35. I'm gonna stay here for a few minutes uh, before we move on to the next initiative petition.
Okay, in about four minutes, we'll go ahead and close uh, a public hearing on initiative petition 35 and then move on to initiative petition 17. So if you have comments on initiative petition 35, um, please raise your hand. For those of you just joining us, we are currently um, on a public hearing on initiative petition 35 that is related to cannabis retailers. If you are here to provide public comment on initiative petition 35, please raise your hand. Okay, I am going to uh, temporarily close the public hearing on initiative petition 35, and I'm going to open a public hearing on initiative petition 17. Uh, this increases the highest corporate minimum taxes, distribute revenues to eligible individuals, and state replaces reduced federal benefits. If you're here to provide public comment on initiative petition 17, please raise your hand. Uh, all right, uh, Derek, it looks like you're the only one. So go ahead and unmute yourself and start your oh. public comments. Good afternoon, everybody. Derek Sangston with Oregon Business and Industry. I'm, call, I'm uh, here to comment on the financial estimate statement for IP17. Uh, I will submit written comments by the deadline. And if you wouldn't mind putting the email address in the chat, that way I could just easily copy and avoid a transcription error. I would greatly appreciate that. I'll just briefly summarize the comments that we'll make in the written comments. One, the LRO uh, report was used by the Financial Estimate Committee to come up with the amount of funds the uh, petition would generate over the next two biennia, 25 and 27 and 27 and 29, uh, and the amount that would be paid out via rebates. Um, LRO in that same report also you also forecasted that there would be a net general fund loss of $1.2 billion and $2.8 billion, both of those rounding up. Voters would be well informed and deserve to know both of those facts. Uh, secondarily, um, the financial impact statement 
touches upon the administrative costs very broadly. Voters would be better informed if they knew some of the things that DOR and DHS would have to uh, do to administer and implement IP17. For instance, DOR would need to hire nearly 200 employees to uh, to uh, find and pay out and protect against fraud um, on the payments of IP17. Voters should know uh, those for certain. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Anyone else here to provide public comments on Initiative Petition 17? Uh, please raise your hand. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and stay here uh, for about 10 minutes uh, just to make sure, and then I'm going to make my way back to the initial list that we started it with and see if there's any more additional comments on either the initiative petitions or the legislative referrals.
Okay, we are still on the public hearing for initiative petition 17. If you are here to provide public comments on that initiative petition, please raise your hand. For those of us who are just joining us, we are about to close the public hearing on initiative petition 17. If you are here to provide public comments on that, you can raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I we're going to go ahead and just uh, temporarily close the, the public hearing on petition 17. And we're going to go back to the very beginning uh, to legislative referral 401. That is the uh, constitutional constitutional amendment related to the impeachment of statewide elected officials by the Oregon legislature. If you're here to provide public comments on either the explanatory statement or the fiscal impact on legislative referral 401, please raise your hand. I don't see anyone raising their hand, so I'm going to go through the list. Is anyone here to provide public comments on legislative referral 402? This is the another amendment uh, to the Constitution related to the establishing of an independent public service compensation com commission to determine salaries for specified officials. Please raise your hand if you're here to provide public comments on that. If you're here to provide public comments on legislative referral 403, which is the statutory amendment related to the establishing of ranked choice voting, please raise your hand. If you're here to provide public comments on initiative petition 35, this is related to the cannabis retailers. Please raise your hand. Okay, if you are here to provide public comments on initiative petition 17, this increases the highest corporate uh, minimum taxes and distributes revenue to eligible individuals. State replaces reduced federal benefits. Please raise your hand. Okay, it looks like no one else is here to provide additional comments. Um, 
I'm going to keep this open until 3.30, uh, just in case uh, anyone joins us that wants to provide public comment. Uh, you are welcome to stay, uh, or you are welcome to, to leave the public, uh, the team's invite. You can go ahead and send us any written comments up until August 2nd at 5 p.m. It's, you can uh, you can actually send me your public comments as well. I will forward them to our elections uh, division, or you can send them directly to elections.sos at sos.oregon.gov. Uh, but I will I will be here till three thirty. So you're welcome to keep me company till then. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks to the elections division team. Thanks, Dean.
Hey everyone, so this is Jessica Ventura. I'm going to keep the public hearing open until 3.30. And if I don't see any new folks jumping on, I will go ahead and close the public hearing then. I'm going to keep myself off camera and mute it. Uh, but if you have any questions, just go ahead and unmute yourself or um, uh, get my attention any way you can.
Hey everyone, we are about a couple minutes away from 3.30, so I have, uh, for the record, have not seen anyone else join the meeting, and no one left, um, to my knowledge, will has additional public comments on Legislative Referral 401, 402, 403, and Initiative Petition 35, and Initiative Petition 17. So I will go ahead and officially close the public hearing. Thanks for everyone who stuck around and I hope you have a good afternoon.